enter, although his name has not been officially disclosed. Benjamin Dean, a FBI special agent on the Salt Lake City Field Office Cellular Analysis Surveillance Team. He took the cell phone tower record that had stored the pings from Koberger's phone and came up with an itinerary of the suspect's travels before and after the murder night. Next, the Moscow cops meticulously plotted all the comings and goings on a series of maps. At a glance, the new evidence seemed deeply incriminating. Koberger was placed near the King Road house immediately before the murder and after, hightailing it away from the scene of the crime in the pre-dawn aftermath. However, when examined closely, it turned out that the maps had been sketched with a swirling, impressionistic Cy Twombly-ish hand, rather than with a cartographer's rigor. What went deliberately? Unmentioned when the police shared their handiwork with, with the public that the cell phone towers cast a wide net. Their range can be as broad as 14 miles. And in a cozy town like Moscow, that takes in a lot of territory. It's more wishful thinking than solid detective work to put Koberger's phone at a precise spot at a certain time. Being in the vicinity is not the same as being at the exact address. Just ask anyone whose Amazon delivery wound up at a neighbor's or any of the combative defense attorneys who've succeeded in convincing courts to question the reliability and accuracy of the FBI's attempts to map the signal footprints cast by cell towers. And so as last Christmas loomed, the hunter's mood was anything but merry. They felt they had their man. But at the same galling time, he was beyond their reach. Literally. Koberger had gotten behind the wheel of his white Hyundai and driven across the country to Albrightsville, Pennsylvania. And all they could do was watch him peel off in the distance. Albeit with an FBI surveillance task force following covertly behind, Koberger had headed home for the holidays. while the authorities' own Christmases would be spent ruminating about the suspect who had slipped through their grasp. It was as if a few of the Moscow cops would moan to their buddies. Koberger was laughing at them, taunting their ineptitude. Was the criminal justice student, in fact, smarter than they were? I'm Derek. Nice to meet you, Derek. I'm with Fox News. I have not met you. I'm sorry. I've met a lot of you guys. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've got a major problem going on, I think. Yeah, tell me what's going on. Uh, well, I, you know, I've been here since the crime commit was yeah. started, and I've been covering Fox Digital, so I've been taking lots of photos. My names are on the photos, and so it started yesterday. I got a message from Batman. From Batman? I don't know who it is. It went through my photography website, mm -hmm. and it says, A God-sized hole in your heart. Okay. Then we go to here, and then it comes from behind you. I you can read it. So kind of thinly veiled, right? Like, uh, I, uh, yeah. Okay. And now, then the next one I got came, and he said, uh, "When do you think they're going to get him? Do you see what I see? Timely song." Okay. Which is weird. And then we go to this last one that I just got this morning. You're a fucking coward, aren't you? Now, yeah. Now, I did a reverse lookup on the internet with my stuff, and that's who it is. Both emails go back to him, and like an idiot, he used 76 in both of his passwords, because that's his birthday. Okay. And, uh, yeah, I've, I've warned my kids at home and my wife, uh, but I just... I, a few dared to wonder, but all was not lost. The cops did have one ace hidden up their sleeves. The killer had made an amateur's mistake. A tan leather knife sheath had been left at the scene of the crime. It had been found in the third floor room. On the bed were the blood spattered bodies of Madison Mogan and Kaylee Gonsalves lay. At first, 
the authorities had exalted. This was the break they had been hoping for. The Idaho State Police Forensic Services in Meridian had quickly gone to work, and they hit the jackpot. Male DNA had been left on the button snap of the knife sheath. Now we got him, the cops and the scientists rejoiced. Only once again, they were wrong. Once again, they were too quick off the mark. The consumer DNA kits that are sold in your local CVS need about 750 to 1,000 nanograms to find out all they need to know about you. And that's not much. That's smaller than a speck of floating dust and a whole lot less substantial. A single nanogram is as heavy as a breeze. It weighs a few trillionths of a pound. There's nothing to it. But crime scenes often contain a whole lot less DNA than that. The forensic teams will re- will routinely wind up with only 100 or so nanograms of DNA. Yet scientists can nevertheless work their magic and use even this microscopic amount of genetic evidence to nail the criminal. The problem, however, was that the DNA on the knife sheath, authorities would concede on background, was less than 100 nanograms. A whole lot less. A mere fraction, in fact, of a single nanogram. Nothing more than just a handful of microscopic-sized cells. In total, according to knowledgeable sources, about 20 cells. Maybe, they whispered, even fewer. The DNA sample was as small as a fragment of a speck balanced on the head of a tiny pin, and it had the Idaho crime lab stymied. It was a scientific challenge beyond their capabilities, but not beyond Othram's and its lab, equipped with a costly Novasec 6000. Some scientists take pride in their lofty detachment. They prefer to muse on big, eternal mysteries, not muck through sordid, all-too-human events. At Othram, though, a gleaming, cutting-edge genetics laboratory in a suburban, high-tech corridor just north of Houston, Texas, there is a shared sense of mission among the two dozen or so assembled lab geeks. They've embarked on a do-gooder's crusade, that, they'll tell you, is tacitly embodied in the company's esoteric moniker. Othram was the name of the impenetrable Black Rock Wall that protected Minas Tirith, a capital city in the imagined universe that comes to life in Lord of the Rings. And the scientists chose this nerdy Tolkien reference to drive home their commitment to the technological wall they're building, a barrier that will protect a very real world by helping to identify the violent criminals lurking undetected in its midst. Othram scientists are forensic detectives. Yet it's a mission that needed capital. Without that seed money, the four-story lab, the multi-million dollar equipment, the team of highly accomplished experts might never have come together and the secrets hidden in the speck of DNA on the tab of the knife sheath found in the Idaho murder house might forever have remained an unfathomable mystery. So then, one starting point on the path that ultimately led in its meandering way to the arrest of Brian Koberger can be traced to John Burbank, a self-made billionaire, venture capitalist, writing a big check about four years ago to the company. Burbank put in $2 million of his own funds and raised another $2 million from sources, as he breezily told me, because I was intrigued by the company's mission. Yet how Burbank, the founder of Passport Capital, a San Francisco-based hedge fund with $4 billion under management, first heard about Othram as another tale. His source was Charles Johnson. His source was Charles Johnson, another tech investor. And once the crusading husband and wife scientists, who were the company's founders, learned of Johnson's background, it reportedly filled them with pangs of despair. 
As Johnson, now 34, told me the story, he was in the midst of a painful divorce and had fled from his marital home in San Francisco to the Woodlands because he'd read it was a great place to live. It was while in this bucolic Houston suburb that he met Othram's founders, doctors David and Kirsten Middleman. And over several conversations, Johnson grew intrigued with the unique genetic technology the company was using to help solve cold cases. The two scientists, he learned, had even larger ambitions. They had dreams of putting together a fully staffed lab and buying the sort of gene sequencing equipment such as the pricey Novasec 6000. That would allow them to unravel the spool of genes that could connect the dots in decades old and often abandoned mysteries. They would free innocents who had been wrongly convicted and they would help track down the actual criminals. Only they needed money to make their dreams a reality. Johnson, he said, subsequently met up with the middlemans again in San Francisco and after a long dinner volunteered to introduce them to his friend John Burbank. It was a marriage made in startup heaven. For a while, Burbank provided the checks and offered a veteran businessman's shrewd advice to the company, and Johnson received a potentially lucrative chunk of stock for playing middleman to the middlemans. It was only later that the scientists found out more about the man who had brokered the deal. The banner headline above a hard-hitting article in the Boston Globe about Johnson was dismaying enough. A race-baiting troll has found acceptance in Trump's D.C. But the disclosures were more distressing. He's argued that black people are dumber than white people, questioned whether six million Jews died in the Holocaust, was banned from Twitter for threatening a Black Lives Matter activist, and posed making a white power sign while standing next to white supremacist leader Richard Spencer. And now Johnson was a fairly significant stockholder in their idealistic, justice-driven creation, a company where key scientists had relatives who had died in the Holocaust. When I met with Johnson for lunch, he offered apologies for his past beliefs. I've evolved, he explained with a terse contrition. But as the long lunch continued, he revealed that many of his prior assertions had actually been role-playing. He'd been acting under orders from intelligence agencies. And he was dutifully constructing an incendiary cover identity. And it was with the knowledge and approval of these clandestine organizations, he said, that he'd met with Julian Assange in London and now assisted companies providing military equipment to the Ukrainian forces. In fact, he varied activities in the shadows while fighting for the national interest that made him, he claimed, a marked man. He was advised to cancel a proposed business trip to London because M15 couldn't guarantee his safety. The Russian FSB, as well as Israeli Mossad, are out to get me, he confided, with a during do fatalism. And then, with a no less impassioned sincerity, he quickly segued. I also feel very proud that I had helped set in motion the events that led to the arrest of Brian Koberger. And that is indeed quite feasibly one starting point for the path that led to the arrest of the man alleged to have brutally murdered the four students. However, a few law enforcement figures close to the events believe that the final tightening of the investigative knots around Koberger had its true beginnings in September of 2014. It was on a bright morning back then that a kayaker energetically paddled down the fast-moving waters of the Snake River, spotted an object floating limply in the distance beneath the Perrine Bridge in Jerome, Idaho. Curious, he broke course to investigate and discovered a woman's body. Over the next four years, investigators doggedly followed a long and winding trail in an attempt to figure out who the woman had been and what had happened to her. They combed the area, checked local restaurants, motels, bus depots, and taxi services. Photos of what remained of the dead woman's face, as well as her fingerprints and DNA samples were run through 
national databases. 14 states reached out to Idaho State Police thinking that Jane Doe matched descriptions of missing persons they were pursuing. All of the feverish detective work, however, led nowhere. In August of 2020, the perplexed investigators finally threw up their hands in despair. The case was officially classified inactive. Its voluminous evidence folders stuffed into one of the many dusty file drawers that were the burial grounds of the frigidly cold cases. But then there was, in relatively rapid succession, a flurry of fortuitous and previously unimaginable events. For starters, Matthew Gamet, the director of the Idaho State Police Forensic Services Laboratory, a hands-on crime scene investigator who was also a scientist with a master's in microbiology as well as someone who had done a fair share of DNA-driven investigations, applied for and won a $3 million grant from the FBI assistance to fund genetic genealogy testing to solve unsolved cases. Spurred on this windfall of government dollars, Idaho officials announced that the state was seeking bids from private companies that had expertise in advanced forensic testing. In July of 2021, Othram won the contract. And one of the first seemingly dead-end cases Gamet sent their way was the mystery of the identity of the female corpse. The coroner had ruled suicide as the cause of death that had been found drifting seven years earlier on the Snake River. Othram solved the mystery. Actually, a large part of the credit belonged to the company's astonishing Novasec 6000 system, developed by Illumina, a pioneering genetics concern, which was able to sequence the scant amount of DNA from the corpse that had been preserved over the years into a picture that told a clear genealogical story. And this story led police investigators to a name that of a woman who had gone missing nearly a decade ago from her home in San Diego. Case closed. And four months later, that unlikely success got Gamut thinking, what if Othram could work its magic? Not just on cold cases, but on a very hot one. A case whose solution might very well be embedded in the microscopic DNA left on the button snap of a knife sheath. But no sooner had this wishful possibility excitedly begun to take hold than it was dismissed. Koberger, they had discovered to their consternation, was in none of the readily accessible public DNA databases. Even if Othram could, miracle of miracles, manage to chart a genetic schematic from the scant substance on the button snap, there'd be no way to connect it directly to the suspect. Then Gamut had a eureka moment and a new path suddenly became clear. A Hail Mary Pass Some cases stay with you. Cops will often admit it. You can't let them go. They ride shotgun on your thoughts. For Pennsylvania State Trooper Brian Knoll, it was the case of Beth Doe. That was what Knoll and his buddies on the Criminal Investigations Unit called the grisly murder mystery that had frustrated the authorities for over 40 years. Just days before Christmas, 1976. Three suitcases had been tossed off a bridge that spanned the Lehigh River in Whitehaven, Pennsylvania. They missed the water, however, and landed on the grassy shoulder running along nearby rural Interstate 80. And when the cops opened them up, they found pieces of a dismembered female body. The victim, an autopsy showed, had been sexually assaulted, strangled, and then shot in the neck. And she had been carrying a nine-month-old female fetus. Trooper Knoll was determined to discover the victim's identity. And then he would catch the killer. Justice, he strongly felt, needed to be done. Someone out there knows who she is, he told reporters. And there is always hope that someone will come forward with information. Yet for all his years of hoping as well as chasing down leads, Noel got nowhere. Then in November of 2020, 
DNA extracted from Beth Doe's skeletal remains were sent to the Othram lab in Texas. It was, said one of the members of the Pennsylvania Criminal Investigation Unit, a Hail Mary pass. We didn't have much hope. But Othram scientists once again did the impossible. A DNA match enabled detectives to identify the butchered woman. And then, despite all the decades that had passed, the alleged killer, a man who had been the victim's livid boyfriend at the time, was arrested. He is out on bail as he awaits trial. At last, Trooper Null felt the murder had been avenged, and it was thanks largely to a bunch of science geeks in the suburbs of Houston. Two years later, on a cold December night, just two days after last Christmas, Noel was once working again, hand in hand with the Othram scientists. Only he didn't know it. He simply focused on his covert mission, stealing garbage. It became known to the WAGs in Troop N, the state troopers who were running the surveillance op, targeting Brian Koberger as he spent Christmas with his parents. As the great trash robbery and the target, was the neatly bagged detritus that had been deposited in the bins outside the squat white two-story home with its faded brown shutters where the Koberger family lived in Albrightsville, Pennsylvania. In the dead of night, Noel, as if on cat's feet, tiptoed in and made off with his treasure trove. Later that same day, a special FedEx package deceptively marked medical material made its way to the Othram lab. The scientists quickly went to work. They extracted promising material from the trash they'd received. With the Novasex 6000 geared up, they hurriedly plotted specific genetic sequences. And when they shared the information with the Idaho Crime Lab about 1,800 miles up north, alarm bells started ringing. It no longer mattered that they had previously drawn a blank, trying to make a link between the DNA on the knife sheath, button, and Brian Koberger. They had succeeded in doing the next best thing. They were convinced that it was good enough. They had matched the speck of DNA recovered from the murder house to the DNA embedded in the trash of Michael Koberger, the suspect's father. And while moralists might find biblical authority for the argument that the father was not responsible for his son's alleged sins, the more practical geneticists had found an indisputable link at least 99.9998% of the male population would be expected to be excluded from the possibility of being the suspect's biological father. QED, the DNA on the knife sheath button belonged, the Idaho authorities asserted, to Michael Koberger's son, Brian. The case now had a seemingly unsplittable atom at its core. It could at least charge forward. On December 29th, an Idaho magistrate read a request for arrest warrant to be issued for Brian Koberger. It was signed with alacrity. And the next day at about 1.30 a.m., Trooper Knoll, along with the tough guy team of state SWAT officers, stormed in to make the arrest. Koberger, a Monroe County, Pennsylvania, assistant district attorney informed reporters, was found awake in the kitchen area, dressed in shorts and a shirt, wearing latex, medical-type gloves, and apparently was taking his personal trash and putting it into separate Ziploc baggies. In the days that followed, Koberger's legal aid attorney would vehemently proclaim his client's innocence and Koberger will have a chance to enter his own plea at a hearing that starts on June 26th in Moscow, Idaho. Yet it is no vaulting supposition to speculate that at the unnerving moment when the police charged in as he sorted his trash with cunning care into individual plastic bags, Brian Koberger, doctoral candidate in criminology, experienced the profoundly disturbing realization that he was not as gifted a student as he'd believed. Last words. 
There's someone here. Three short words. A curt, declarative sentence. Yet filled. It can all too easily be imagined with an immensity of apprehension. Perhaps even an intimidation of the horror that was to come. They were the last words that, according to the Moscow police, Dylan Mortensen, one of the two surviving roommates, had heard Kaylee Gonsalves speak in the helter-skelter moments before her death. I am replaying this fearful testament in my mind as I stand transfixed outside the King Road house as the night comes falling on a wintry day. I look out into the darkness and the volumes implicit in those few words reverberate through my imagination. It's eerie. It's as if the furies that were set loose in those fateful pre-dawn moments are still swirling about. Yet once I walk away, heading down the icy street and leaving the house behind, the instant passes. The echoing sentence slides away slipping off to be stored deep in the recesses of my reporter's memory. And it stays there, not forgotten, yet inert. Then, without warning, the words return, catching me by surprise. It is months later, a new, fresh spring, and this time the night has come falling on a verdant corner of the Pennsylvania countryside. I am standing outside the crime scene house that's just a stone's throw from the campus of DeSales University. When Brian Koberger was a grad student here, one of his professors was Dr. Catherine Ramsland. She's a celebrated forensic psychologist and prolific author. One of the required texts in her course was her own book, Inside the Minds of Serial Killers, Why They Kill. It is a grim yet fascinating work filled with case studies that give support to the professor's earnest wisdoms. Fantasy, she writes with authority, also builds an appetite to experience the real thing. Standing on a patch of grass, staring into the dark stone house, I can picture an impressionable student walking through an interior staged with corpses and blood and the warning in Ramsland's cautionary logic is driven home. And I find myself measuring an increasingly rage-filled journey that hardened a spirit until its secret impulses might very well have led him into the deep shadows of a house on the other side of the country, where a voice blurted out with sudden, awful comprehension. There's someone here. Be sure to check out my other videos and playlists for more true crime content. And if that's not enough, you can join our Patreon. Don't have a tinfoil hat? It's okay. We'll make you one. It's that easy. See you guys in the next video. See you later. Bye.